uh, man, it has been literally since winter chill, since I've seen some of y'all, uh, we had some people helping out teaching and it is just, it is good to be back. If you have your Bibles, open up to Job. That's where we're going to be spending our time, which I know was like the one thing you were really hoping that I would say is Job. Uh, I had it on my, my, a uh, whiteboard in my office earlier this week and Joanna came, I mean, someone on our staff came in and was like, I'm not gonna lie to you. I have been wondering why your whiteboard said job for the past three days. And I just could like, it didn't click until today that it was Job. That's where we're gonna be spending our time. Uh, and as you're opening your Bibles there and I'm opening my notes and all of this stuff, uh, I just I feel like I've missed y'all. I feel like there's just so much that I've missed. And so uh, one of the things that's happened over the past week, this is like an insignificant milestone. And it's about my kids. So some of y'all are like, all right, I'm done. Like, I'm, I can't do this anymore. I don't care. My kids are all I have. Uh, Betsy, the other day, my one-year-old, she realized the magic and wonder of Instagram face filters. Uh, and she didn't do it on her own. Like, Maisie was, uh, like, acting a fool. Emma was trying to make uh, dinner for us. And so I just got my phone. I was like, Maisie, come look at this. Uh, Betsy, come look at this. And I had them both right there. And I was hoping, if I'm being totally honest, because I'm kind of like a punk of a dad, I was hoping it would really freak them out. And they would see something and be like, and what's happening? And I thought it would scare them a little bit. And I'd get a good laugh and in trouble with Emma and all that stuff. But what ended up happening was Betsy's two favorite ones on Instagram were the one where your face falls off your head. She thought that was hilarious, which kind of creeps me out a little bit. And then the other one where like, you go like this and your mouth's just like, whoop, and like it goes the size of your entire body. I thought for sure, foolproof, no way this doesn't go the way I wanted, that that would terrify her. And even when I was doing it, I was like, Betsy, look. She looked at me so unimpressed as if she thought I thought my mouth was really doing that. And that goes back to this. And so now the weird thing is there, were, there was somebody at church like just checking their phone and my little one-year-old goes, <laughs> at their phone, I'm like, listen, she's fine for the most part, but that's her thing. Like she's just started going, and for Maisie, it was the one where it's like your, your tongue because like a dog's tongue and it goes all the way out. And she thought that was hilarious. And, and, and my girls, they just get attached to like phone video things. And that's just kind of the way that it goes. Even le- every night, Maisie, our three-year-old, mom, can I watch a, can I watch a movie? I was a baby, which is hilarious because she's three and basically still a baby. But every night, can I watch a movie when I was a baby? And there was one that, that was, is of me from when she's a baby because when Maisie would get out of control and when she'd get a little like ornery, Emma would play this video that I recorded where it's me pretending to FaceTime my child. So I don't wanna be like, I lied to her, but it also was a little deceptive. But it was this video where it'd be like, Maisie, are you doing okay? What, what'd you do today? And it's just this like four minute video of conversation of me just talking and she thought it was the greatest thing ever. And there's one night where I was uh, at my office and Emma calls me and she's like, listen, Maisie is losing her ever loving mind. I need you to get home. I'm playing the video. And at that point, like we, it is seasoned enough. I knew that meant like she's playing that four minute video over and over and over. And so in my mind, I built this up to this like incredible powerful moment. I knew when I walked in the door, it would be like the door opens and like theme music plays and like the fog machine kicks in and Maisie would look up and see her father walking in and come up and say, father, welcome home. I love you so much because her dad was home. Did not quite go that way. I walked in the living room. She, she's, so that was pretty hurtful. And then I went and I sat down next to her and I was like, hey, Maisie. She goes, da, 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 da. I was like, Yes, I am here. I have a, ri- I have a rivet. I have a right. I'm, I'm here. And so she looks up at me and looks back down her phone. And so then I was like, maybe she just hasn't registered that I am not still like on my phone talking to her on this video. And so I took the phone away from her, which I did not know is how World War III starts in our home. But that like blew every gasket in her mind and she lost it. She, and I gave it back and it was like instantly silent. And I took it away and I gave it back and she's, 
And it was the weirdest thing because she, she was wanting the video of me the whole time. I'm like, child, I'm right here. Please pay attention to me. And the whole time, it doesn't does matter. She just wants the video. As we're getting ready to, to dive into Job, that's kind, of, that's kind of the thing that it addresses. That's kind of the tension that we see in the book of Job. Uh, the book of Job is like the oldest story that we have in scripture. It, it predates the writing of Genesis. Obviously, like it's not before creation, but it predates the writing. It's the oldest story of humankind that we have on record. And what we see is God and humankind and the question of, do you value the gifts that God gives or the one who gives it? Well, what do you value more? The, the, the things that God gives us in our life or the one who gives them? And for Maisie right then, she's showing the same tension that we feel thousands and thousands or depending on your view, like millions and millions, like whatever. A long time later, she wanted the, the thing that I made for her. She just wanted the video. She couldn't care less that her beloved and wonderful father was sitting right next to her. She wanted the thing that I gave. And so the question for, for this series as we're walking through the book of Job is this, is God enough? Is God enough? I'm going to ask that every single turn that we have in this text, is God enough? Because that is what Job is having to wrestle with through this passage. Is God enough or is he only there for the things that God gives him? And so we see Job and we see a little bit into who he is in the first five verses of the book. There was once a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz or Uz or Uz, however you want to say it. He was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and stayed away from evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 teams of oxen, and 500 female donkeys. He also had many servants. And just in case you're like me, we're like, that means nothing. The next sentence is for you. He was, in fact, the richest in that entire area. So dude is loaded and has a great family. Job's sons would take turns preparing feasts in their homes and they would also invite their three sisters to celebrate with them. When those celebrations ended, sometimes after several days, Job would purify his children. He'd get up early in the morning and offer burnt offerings for each of them. For Job said to himself, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular practice. Now, students, what we see in the first five verses of Job is building this story, building this persona or this character of Job. And, and he is like complete integrity. He is as close to perfect as possible. What we find out is he's got a great family. He's got a, a lot of wealth, the richest in the land. He's probably incredibly powerful. And so as we're looking at the book of Job and, and we know it's about suffering, one of the questions we have to wrestle with is, does Job suffer because he did something wrong? And from the very beginning, we see no, it's not, it's not punishment. And sometimes sin may be punishment. Like if you sprint straight into that wall over there, it will hurt because you did a dumb thing. That's not really what Job is talking about. Job is this man who, who loves and honors and fears God so much. He's making sacrifices for his kids. He's pouring into them, following God. He's modeling for them what it's like to follow after God. He is doing everything possible in the right way. He's making all the right call, uh, calls. And the natural, like when you're reading this story, you're supposed to read it and think everything good is gonna follow him. And as we see in verse 13, not necessarily the case. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting at the oldest brother's house, a messenger arrived uh, at Job's home with, his, with this news. Your oxen were plowing with the donkeys, feeding beside them. And the Sa uh, Sabians raided us. They stole all the animals and killed all the farmhands. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Job's family's all hanging out at their kid's house. It's this beautiful picture of, of uh, joy and family and community. And Job is at his home with his wife. There's a knock on the door and everything's gone. Now, here's the thing. We can't really empathize with Job. For most of us, we're not really gonna be able to emotionally put ourselves in Job's shoes and understand what he's going through. We just don't have a, a relatable context. But for this, this would be like if you're at home having a, having a meal with your family and you, there's a knock on the door and you open the door and there's a police officer out there who informs your parents that the, that the business uh, your mom or your dad are in has been robbed all of the accounts are gone and everything that you have has disappeared. You no longer can even afford the food on your plate. It's this pit in your stomach. 
all of their future security, all of their retirement, all of their hope, all of the things that he would pass on to his kids are gone. And it's at the the hands of someone else because someone did something to Job. It's not anything he deserved. But then we see in this next verse, while he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with news. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up your sheep and all the shepherds. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Now look at this verse in 16. This is, this is important. We don't want to miss this. The fire of what? Let's try, let's try out loud this time. The fire of? Much better. The fire of God. Now we look at that and it's, it's, most, it's most likely lightning, like a lightning storm that brought an end to like thousands of sheep, which is kind of funny if you think about it for a second, but then like people died too and it's a really big deal. But God has the agency. That's, that's the term for, he is the, the one who acts. And so now Job has lost uh, his, his agricultural business, his pasture, his lambs, his servants, countless wealth at the hands of other people and God. Like there is nothing that he did to cause a lightning storm to strike. But it's not done there. The next verse. While he was still speaking, a third messenger arrived with this, <clears throat> with this news. Three bands of Chaldean raiders have stolen your camels and killed your servants. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. 3,000 camels, gone. All of his servants, gone. At this point, the hits just keep coming. And then kind of the icing on the cake, verse 18 and 19. While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. Your sons and your daughters were feasting in their oldest brother's home. Suddenly a powerful wind swept in from the wilderness and hit the house on all sides. The house collapsed and all of your children are dead. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. In what might be history's worst afternoon, Job, at the hands of other people and at the hands of God, has lost everything that he has. And I'm not gonna like ask you to close your eyes and imagine what it would be like because I think we know what suffering is. I think for a lot of us, I know your stories and I know what you've walked through the past year, two years, three years. And some of you in here have gone through incredible suffering. And then the question becomes, why does this happen? We look at Job's life and it's, it's is it punishment? Is it sin? Is it uh, uh, just like nature and you can't really control what's happening? What's going on? And if I'm Job, I have lost everything. And I am beginning to wonder how this happened. But the thing is, as readers in his story, we get to back up a few verses and see exactly what went, hap- what went down. Verses six through eight. One, of the, uh, one day the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord and the accuser, Satan, came with them. Where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan. And Satan answered the Lord, I've been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. And the Lord asked Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? He's the finest man in all the earth. He's blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil. Students, in the situation for Job, what we see in this passage is Satan wasn't even trying to pick a fight with Job. Satan wasn't even trying to do anything in his life. God was the one who brought Job into the spotlight. God is the one who who started this, this chain of events. We see in verse nine, Satan replied to the Lord, Yeah, but Job has good reason to fear God. You've always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. You've made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. But surely reach out and take away all that he has and he will curse you to your face. Satan takes this truth. Yes, Job loves God and worships God. And he twists it just a little bit. And he says, God, here's the thing. He only loves you because of the things that you give him. He only follows you because of the way that you bless him and protect him. And that's, that's the question that we have to ask ourselves tonight. Is God enough? Do you love God for who he is and what he's done in you? Or do you only love God because of the blessings that he gives your life? When you think about who you are and the things that you have, whether that's uh, friends or family or material things or talents or passions or opportunities, if all of that was gone, is God enough? And Satan's argument to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is if you take that away, he's not gonna follow you. And then verse 12, all right, you may test him. The Lord said to Satan, do whatever you want with everything he possesses, but don't harm him physically. 
Job lost all of his livestock, all of his herds, all of his servants, his children and their families. And God knew. And God allowed it. It wouldn't have happened had God stopped it. And so you read that and you're like, okay, so how does Job respond? And I think we see an incredibly healthy response in 20 and 21. Job stood up and tore his robe in grief. He shaved his head and fell to the ground to worship. He said, I came naked from my mother's womb and I'll be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. Job did two things. Verse, verse 20, he, he tears his clothes and shaves his head. It is this planned, intentional, ceremonial mourning. It's, it's an expression, an outward expression of grief. And students, this is, this is really important, and I need you to hear me say this. When bad things happen, it is okay to grieve. I never want you to feel like we at FSM would say like, oh, something bad happened, suck it up. Oh, no, 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 it's not, no, that's not worth crying. You shouldn't process that. Like Job tears his clothes, shaves his head. Grieving matters. God wired us to do certain things. And so if anybody ever tells you, no, God's got it and all things work together and it's gonna be great, so quit crying. That's not biblical. Job tears all of his clothes, shaves his head, outward grief, but he says, listen, it's all God's anyway. He's the one in control. He's the one calling the shots, and I trust him. This is awful, and I'm mourning, but I trust him. But Satan's not done. In chapter two, verse four and five, Satan replied to the Lord, skin for skin, a man will give up everything he has to save his life, but reach out and take away his health, and he'll surely curse you to your face. He says, listen, no, 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 it's just you took what he had, not, not his health, not, not who he is, not anything that's really going to hurt. In verse 6 through 7, or 5 through 7, uh, all right, yeah, yeah, sorry, verse 6, all right, do them as you please, the Lord said to Satan, but spare his life. So Satan left the Lord's presence, and he struck Job with terrible boils from head to foot. Now, boils, we don't really hear about that a lot. Here, let me just kind of paint a picture. And for those of you that want to read a little bit more, uh, chapter seven, verse five, gives a little bit more description into that. But just imagine, head to toe, you have gaping wounds, raw and exposed, infected, and, and oozing pus out. Head to toe, covering these. And anytime any air touches it, it stings. Anytime any of your clothes rub against it, it hurts. Excruciating, chronic, uh, uh, unceasing pain. And in 7.5, we see not only is it open source oozing with pus, there's dirt that clogs them up and, and increases the infection, and they are so bad, his body is infested with maggots. This is some like super sick zombie apocalypse, walking dead junk, and it is, it is, it is constant. And he didn't do anything to deserve it. There's nothing in this where it's like, oh, dude, you, uh, you went and swam in that river? Yeah, that's the no-no river. You shouldn't have done that. That's on you. Like, it just happened. It just happened, and he has these sores, chronic pain, excruciating pain, and his wife, verse 9, is done with it. His wife said to him, are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Curse God and die. And we read that, and we're like, oh, okay, settle down. But think about what she's been through. She has lost everything her husband has worked for. She has lost all of her children and grandchildren. She has lost every possession they have. And she has watched the love of her life contract these sores that cause pain every moment of every day. And all she wants is for him to have relief from the pain that she cannot help. And so just imagine, just imagine the way that the spiritual world had to sit on pins and needles after she says this. Because Satan has been doing his absolute best to cause Job to stumble, to cause Job to turn on God. And so I just imagine as she says, curse God and die, Satan just eager to hear Job's response and the the entire armies of hell eager to hear Job's response and the angels looking at Job and, and just waiting and knowing like this is gonna go one way or another in this moment because the very person that is his best friend on earth is causing him and pushing him to turn away from the Lord, and then God sitting on his throne, knowing exactly what's about to be said. Verse 10, 
Job replied, you talk like a foolish woman, which is not like a safe thing to say, guys. Don't like pull that card unless you have been covered with boils and filled with maggots. Like, it's just not worth it. Job goes for it, swings for the fences. You talk like a foolish woman, but get this. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? So in all of this, Job said nothing wrong. He went through the ultimate test and his ultimate response was ultimate trust. He said, listen, none of this was mine in the first place. None of this was was under my control or within my power or authority in the first place. And if I can be totally honest with you, I don't know I don't know if that's my response. Like if I'm, if I'm in Job's shoes right now and I have lost everything and everyone and every element of joy in life and, and then my wife is like, just be done. I think at that point I'm like, yeah, I'm out. But I'd like to be able to sit here and say like, no, God is good and the Lord gives and takes away and I'll trust in the Lord forever and but I haven't been in Job's shoes. As I've been prepping this message, and, and one of the things, and I didn't even share this with junior high, one of the things is I've been walking through Job that God just continually brings to mind. I love teaching, I love preaching, I love like talking with people. And one of the things that I've just really felt God working into my heart is, what if I took away your power of speech? What if, whether through sickness or inexplicable miracle, you were no longer able to speak? Am I enough? And honestly, students, that's been, some, that's been like really difficult for me to wrestle with because if I, if I think about it, I was like, yeah, God, like I'd type stuff and it'd be fine. And, and then really like putting myself in that situation and saying if I lost the thing that is, is like the gift and the talent that I feel like is most joy-filled for me and God just took it, am I enough becomes a bigger question. And so what do we do with these two chapters of Job where we see a God who is in control, knows bad things are about to be happening to a person who loves him with all of his being, complete integrity, and says, go for it. What do we do? And he gives us these three, three easy takeaways. And for most of us, this is gonna be really, really basic. And I know that. But it's still the truth of what these passages say. And the first thing is this, sin is real. Like, When you look at the story of creation, Genesis 1, God creates everything. Genesis 2, God gives it order and structure. Genesis 3, we break it. And so for the rest of human history, we have a broken world. And in that brokenness is when sin and death and suffering and pain and grief and everything else work their way in. And so this idea that like, no, life is is great, like kind of, but sin is real. And we're fooling ourselves if we pretend that suffering isn't real and try and not grieve and try and act like it doesn't happen. Sin is real. The second thing that we see in this, Satan is determined. And I know for some of you that are like, I don't really know if I even believe in the spiritual stuff. This sounds like strange, but but he's determined. When you look at scripture, like when you look at the Bible, it says he's like a lion uh, roaming about seeking whom he may devour. Satan is looking for someone to eat up. And then he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Here's the thing. Neither of those passages say, uh, Satan is big and bad and gonna ruin you unless you love Jesus. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say he's, he's prowling around seeking whom he may devour unless you've prayed a prayer. Scripture tells us he is a real threat and he is, as we see in Job, limited by God. And and if you have given your life to the Lord and you follow Jesus, there are limits to what Satan is able to do. But hear me say this really, really clearly. He's still real. And it's not like you go to winter chill and on Saturday you raise your hand and give your life to the Lord and Satan's like, all right, well, crap. Next up, let's see who we're gonna mess with now. Like, it's not like that. When you give your life to the Lord, you are signed and you are secured But his new mission is to destroy you. His new mission is to wreck your life because he already has nothing that he can hold over your eternity. So your life on earth becomes his task. There's this saying that looks really good on a grandma's pillow, but I don't know how true it really holds up. And it says, the safest place is the center of God's will. And it's like, amen. Job, what do you think? 
Forget that, man. Heck no. And I get what that saying's trying to say, like, man, when you are following God and doing what he calls you to do, he's going to protect you, he's going to keep you safe, and nothing Satan can do can stop God's plan. And I get that, but I bet Job would feel like that's a pretty insensitive thing. As soon as you follow Jesus, when you answer whether or not he is enough, there will be things that go wrong. There will be times where pain happens, where loss happens, where grief happens. As the band comes up and we go into a time of worship, the last thing is this, God is faithful. I told you this is super simple. Sin is, sin is real, Satan's determined, God is faithful. Through all of Job and all of his suffering, God never pulls away. There are times, and we're gonna talk about this next week when we cover literally the rest of Job, but uh, there are times when God has some really hard things to say to Job. There are times when God lovingly corrects and it's like, oh, I'm sorry, were you there when I formed the whole world? No, sit down, sir. Like there are some really tough things that God says to Job, but God never removes his presence from Job. God never removes his ultimate protection on him. And so what I want you to know is when you're wrestling with is God enough, he is never gonna leave. He is never gone. And so here, here's what I want us to do. Just before we go into this time of, of singing this and proclaiming this, I want you to bow your heads. And I want you to think of the most important thing in your entire world right now. That may be uh, uh, your boyfriend or girlfriend. And if you're here with your boyfriend and girlfriend and it's not them, don't tell them that, but it's probably good for them to know anyway. It might be family members. It might be your future hopes and dreams. It might be your phone. It might be parents, whatever that most important thing is. And I just want you to think about what happens if they're gone, is God enough? And it's easy for us to say, yeah, God's enough. But really try and imagine what it'd be like if that most important thing was taken away for whatever reason, is God enough? And then that next thing on the list, whatever it is that you've got pictured, the, the next most important thing, if it's taken away, is God enough? Can you honestly say if that thing was ripped out of your life that you could say, yes, this hurts and that's not fun and that's not good, but I trust that God is still on his throne. Because here's what happens when we have a, a, a movement of students who really would answer and say, yes, God is enough. What does that do? That takes away the power of Satan. That takes away his potential because if there is nothing that you treasure more than the Lord, he cannot take your most treasured thing. And we become not just this group of students who gather together and hang out, but we become a, a movement of people who can't be stopped by an enemy because he can't take away what matters most. If we can get to a point where we honestly say, yes, he is enough for me, that's when we start to see lives change. That's when we start to see transformation happen. That's when, when people at your school look at your life and the way that you live and the way you respond to tragedy and pain and suffering, and they see something a little bit different. And that's when hope comes crashing into hopelessness, when light comes breaking into darkness, when truth comes breaking into curiosity and doubt, when we say he is enough and nothing else can take his place. And so that is my hope and that is my prayer for us as we go into a really tough part of the semester when school is dragging on and, and uh, summer is so close. But we have this incredible potential, this incredible moment to impact the places that we live. My hope and my prayer is that you would be able to say, regardless of the blessings, regardless of the gifts, regardless of the, the pain and the joy that comes in life, either way, he is enough. Would you stand? I just want to pray over our, the rest of our time together and us as we go into this song. God, I pray that that would be true. That our lives would be marked not by a, a pursuit of our future, a pursuit of our stuff, a pursuit of other people, but that we would be a people marked by the pursuit of you. And that we would trust whatever else happens, not that, not that we're going to love it all and not that it's all going to be easy, but that we would say you are enough for us. Lord, you give and you take away. We don't need any of that stuff as long as we have you. We love you, Lord. It's your name we pray. Everybody said.